episode 17. God bless you and thank you for listening today. Welcome to another episode of Bible FAQ with Kirk Van. I'm Kirk Van Odeham, your host for the podcast that provides brief, thoughtful, and biblical answers to your questions. And I am so uh, pleased and humbled that so many different people have been tuning into our podcast. And uh, thank you, each and every one of you who have listened, and especially our repeat listeners, for tuning in today and to every episode that you've uh, taken part with. And we're, I'm doing my best to make this uh, as interesting and intriguing as possible. And I certainly invite you to submit your questions that I can address on future episodes. So thank you all who listen. Very quickly, uh, if you'd like to submit a question to be addressed on a future episode, you can do so by visiting the website, which is kirkvan.com. Uh, just go to the contact link there and you can submit your question via a form on the website. You can also connect to our pay- Facebook page, which is facebook.com slash Bible FAQ with Kirk Van. And uh, once you connect and like our page, uh, then you can send us a private message with your question via Facebook. Or if you prefer, you can email a question to question at kirkvan.com. Uh, however you decide to do it, we would be so Uh, blessed and thankful to receive your question and do our very best to answer it at some point in time as soon as we can possibly get to it. We do have several other questions that we're going to answer that have been submitted. Thank you for your patience as we get to uh, the various questions uh, in due time. Well, I want to try to get right to uh, today's question uh, because it may take a fair bit of time to address fully and I'll do my best to do it briefly. Uh, But today's question is from Stormy in Yorktown, Indiana, who contacted uh, the podcast through our Facebook page. And uh, the question reads, do parents determine their children's salvation? When does it stop being their responsibility? If so. So basically this question is asking uh, about young children and the status of their salvation. For example, if a young child should pass away before she reaches the age that she is able to believe and respond to God in faith uh, for salvation herself, what would happen in such cases like this? And of course, this is a tough question. And the primary reason it's a tough question is because the Bible does not appear to directly address those who do not have the mental capability of believing and responding to God in faith for salvation. And this would certainly include pre-born or infants or young children even. And this should really not be surprising to us since the Bible is a practical book uh, that has as its focus to address those who are capable of responding. It shouldn't surprise us and neither should it disturb us or dishearten us that the Bible doesn't address such cases. Uh, But the reason we shouldn't be disheartened or disturbed uh, by a lack of understanding and biblical understanding in this area is because we know that God is faithful and loving and just and we should simply have faith in him and believe that he has a gracious, merciful plan for the mentally incompetent, including children, just as he does uh, for those of us who are not so. As Genesis 18 and 25 said, Abraham said, shall not the judge of all the earth do right? And of course, the answer to that rhetorical question is, of course, God is the righteous judge and he will always do right so we can trust him. Now, if you think about it, what good purpose would it serve for God to reveal his plan in such cases? Why would God need to address an audience who is not capable of responding? On the other hand, we can think of good reasons why God would choose not to address such a question directly in Scripture. Perhaps he simply just wants us to have faith in him and to trust him on this matter and not worry about it. Or perhaps he wants to encourage those of us who are parents 
and in the ministry and other believers to share the gospel with every age group, even the youngest children, to train everyone in the principles of the world, of the word, excuse me, definitely not the principles of the world, but in the principles of the word so that young children will be prepared to respond to God at the very earliest moment in life possible. At any rate, whatever God's uh rationale may be, as is the case with many topics and questions. The Bible may not answer the question directly or clearly, but may still provide us with some clues or indications that give us important insights into such questions. So since this is in fact not an area that uh, scripture addresses clearly or directly, to some degree we're free to hypothesize and, and, and contemplate the possibilities. But we should not, in my humble opinion, be overly dogmatic or adamant about such questions. So in address, uh, the reason for that is we simply don't know. There, there could be things that God just has decided not to reveal to us. So in addressing this question today regarding the salvation status of young children when they pass away, I will simply share some common insights, theories, and Christian views on the topic and evaluate uh, through various scriptural passages, the support or evidence for those views. For first, let me uh, clarify a couple of things that are necessary as a starting point before we tack tackle this question about salvation of young children. And these are just principles in the Word that we must not forget when we're dealing with salvation in, uh, in general. One is that all humer humanity inherits the original sin nature, uh, and therefore every person is guilty before God. Now, um, I don't have time to expound upon this, that this is pretty much basic theology. If you want to read more about that from the Bible, I would refer you to Romans chapter 5 for a good overview uh, of these important principles, as well as other verses of Scripture. So that tells us that even young children are not exempt uh, from this, of, from being guilty before God in, to some degree. Even though an infant or a child has not committed personal sin, all people are guilty before God because of inherited or imputed sin that's passed us down to us from the original sin of Adam and Eve themselves. In fact, Psalm 51, verse 5, David even reminds us, Behold, I was shapen in iniquity, and in sin did my mother conceive me. So we understand that even the preborn and the infants have some uh, culpability, I guess you could say, before God for sin. And we'll get to the ramifications of that later on. Another important principle that we must uh, emphasize is before we address this question is salvation only comes through faith in Jesus Christ. Uh, John 14 and 6, Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. There's no other way to God. There's no other way to salvation but through Jesus Christ. Peter reiterated this principle. And speaking of Jesus Christ, neither is there salvation in any other. For there is none other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. And of course, that's Acts 4 and 12. Peter emphasizing that Jesus uh, the person in the name of Jesus is the only way to be saved. And then one final principle I'll point out that while salvation only comes through faith in Jesus Christ, we understand that faith unto salvation comes through becoming born again. John 3 and 5, Jesus answered, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, except a man be born of water and of spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. And Peter, who was given the keys of the kingdom to unlock the kingdom uh, to both the Jews and the Gentiles, he said on the day of Pentecost, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. So these are the keys of the kingdom. And the same experience was had in Acts chapter 10 among Gentile believers. Uh, this is the born-again experience that Jesus Christ himself referred to. There's many other verses that we could talk about, but these are the basic precepts and principles regarding salvation that we must keep in mind whenever we broach the topic. So where does this leave infants and young children on the status of their salvation? Well, let's look at a few Christian views. 
I'm going to talk about five categories of views. And the first one here is uh, that there are some hypotheses that seemingly have no biblical support whatsoever. They're just figments of someone's imagination at some point in time in history, but the, yet they have been views that people have advanced and believed upon, and some still do believe them. For example, some believed many years ago especially, but maybe even some now, certainly some now, uh, that uh, in, in the case of those who believed it, unbaptized children could not go to heaven, but neither would they go to hell. So they said there was a place that they called, referred to as limbo, where these children would go. They would neither be punished, neither would they be rewarded. And this was a prominent view in many different Christian traditions. I would say until very recently, and although there's still some adherence to that view, it seems to have been abandoned by most. Uh, another view, which really has various iterations of this view, is that in some way, shape, or form, and again, I won't go into the specifics of the various iterations, but in some way, shape, or form, uh, every individual who dies as a young child or uh, will have the opportunity for salvation at some point in time after death. And again, there have been historically various ways that people have envisioned how this would work. Uh, but the main thing that these views have in common is they're not found in the Bible. There's not any biblical support for them, yet they are views that were advanced at one point in time. Another view uh, is that uh, young children will be judged based on God's foreknowledge of what they would have done. So, uh, you know, a children dies without ever having, you know, having the capacity or the capability uh, of receiving salvation uh, because they don't have the, the moral agency with which to understand or respond to the gospel or the revelation of God. Therefore, God's in God's judgment, he judges based upon what each individual would have done if their life would not have been cut short. And I suppose that's f philosophically feasible. Uh, but it certainly raises lots and lots of questions the which we don't really have the time to discuss here today. And, uh, and so personally, I'm very skeptical of this view because it seems to lack biblical evidence and support. Again, philosophically, logically, it's feasible. It could have some truth to it, but we don't have much biblical reason to believe such a view. Now, another view that people have, and they do believe they have some biblical support for this, and we'll look at that here in a moment, but the view is that young children's salvation is determined by that of his or her parents in a few different ways. So again, the view is that young children's salvation is determined by the parents. And this is what the questioner specifically asked about. Do parents determine the children's salvation? And if so, when does that stop being their responsibility? Now, those who kind of adhere to this view uh, believe that they find support in Scripture. And there's really two primary places where they believe they have some, some semblance of support. One is two different episodes in Acts, uh, Acts 10 and, and Acts 16, that refers to, in Acts 10, it refers to Peter, uh, you know, delivering the gospel to the Cornelius, the first Gentile, and his household, which would include his family and his servants and everyone else. And in Acts 11 and 14, when Peter is recounting the events of Acts 10, he specifically uh, is recounted the instructions he received from the angel to go deliver the words of salvation so that he and all his household can be saved. So he said, see here, this says the whole household. So the, the parents are responsible for the, uh, in their view, judging on the, these this verse, uh, is the parent is responsible for the salvation of the house or the children. And similar in Acts 16 with the Philippians jailer, uh, the jailer says, what must I do to be saved? And I'm paraphrasing here, but uh, uh, Paul told them, uh, uh, believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and thou and all thy household shall be saved, is, is what it says. Additionally, uh, and we'll, we'll look at these in just a moment, but in 1 Corinthians 7, uh, 12 through 14, uh, the, in, in this passage, uh, uh, Paul is speaking about divorce and he is saying, you know, if, if, a if a brother has a wife, that's not a believer, uh, but she's pleased to dwell with him. She, she, she's not 
trying to leave, don't divorce her, don't put her away, but stay with her. And then he also says, if a woman has a husband that's an unbeliever and he's okay with staying there, if he's pleased to dwell with her, then she should not leave him either. And then in verse 14, he makes a statement. The King James reads, for the unbelieving husband is sanctified by the wife and the unbelieving wife is sanctified by the husband. And here's where the children come in. Else were your children unclean, but now are they holy. So some people believe this to say, look, the believing parent has a responsibility for the salvation of their children, according to this verse. Now, I am personally skeptical of this view that young children's salvation is determined by their parents for a couple of reasons. And in all three of these passages, both the passages in Acts and in the passage here in 1 Corinthians 7, I believe that there's other, and in my opinion, better explanations for these passages than to assume and to conclude that it's the, sal it's the parent's responsibility for the salvation of their children. By their salvation status or by their action, their children will be automatically uh, saved. For example, in both Acts 10 and 16, uh, uh, I think what you we can infer from this idea of the house being saved is that one of two things, either, either they, these individuals had a specific word of knowledge for these cases, that they somehow had foreknowledge that in that particular case, everyone that was present, that was receiving uh, the word, all the family members and friends that were present in both of those cases, that they would be saved. Maybe God showed them that. Uh, but that's we can't imply that every single case uh, that when a person is saved, all everyone in their house is automatically saved. That goes against so much New Testament teaching that we'll get to in a moment. Or it could just simply be hyperbolic referring to the influence that Cornelius would have upon his family and his household in teaching them uh, of the ways of Jesus Christ and, and that the, the jailer himself would have. And in the case of Acts 16 uh, with the Philippian jailer, when he said, what must I do to be saved? There are some Bible scholars that have concluded he's not referring to the salvation experience of, of uh, eternal life, but what he's referring to is uh, in the context, he's referring to not getting in trouble, not being executed for dereliction of his duty to guard the prisoners safely. And so that's what he's asking. Whether that's the case or not, we could debate and discuss. But the point here is there's other explanations of what could be meant there that doesn't lead to us believing that somehow Cornelius and the Philippian jailer, because they received the gospel, that their families were automatically saved, every one of them apart from personal faith themselves. And also there's no mention of young children or infants in either of these uh, for all we know, all the, all the family that were present were adults. Uh, there's so many different things that we could point to. Now, when it comes to 1 Corinthians 7 and this idea of the children uh, uh, could have been unclean, but they are holy because of the believing parent that they have in the household. Well, I could find that easier to grasp if it were not for the fact that this verse of scripture also talks about the unbelieving spouse, whether it be an unbelieving husband or an unbelieving wife, is sanctified in the King James Version or made holy by the believing spouse. So if we take that to mean that this adult non-believing spouse could be saved simply by, by being married to a believer Again, that seems to contradict many other passages in the New Testament that refer to our salvation uh, being a personal, uh, individual experience and any condemnation that is given being a result uh, of our deeds and actions that we do. And so um, both cannot be true. And so I think there's better explanation for this. And again, it probably... A better explanation in my mind would just be referring to the benefit of a godly influence existing in the home, which would certainly be a powerful factor in leading other family members to Jesus Christ and finding salvation, but not an automatic just by virtue of the family relationship by any means. So when we conclude that these verses have other and possibly better explanations and interpretations, 
than the biblical support and evidence for this view uh, that young children's salvation is determined by their parents seems to disappear. Now, another view uh, that some have held, uh, it's not very popular or common today, although some do kind of hold it doctrinally, uh, is that young children uh, who pass away will suffer damnation. In other words, they'll go to hell. And this view is, you know, simply uh, internally consistent uh, view of the doctrine of original sin, that we all inherit or imputed the original sin of Adam and Eve. And to be internally consistent, this would mean that until a person uh, accepts Jesus Christ, responds to faith, experiences a new birth, uh, that no individual, if they don't do this, can inherit eternal life. And therefore, the default uh, option would be that they would suffer damnation. And so this is the primary reason, this kind of understanding is the primary reason why some Christian traditions practice infant baptism, because they believe that baptism itself removes the moral guilt of original sin. And so therefore, wanting their children to be saved, they baptize them immediately. Um, and and uh, so that that's kind of, more could be said, but that's kind of a general overview of the view. Historically, this was very uh, common. Now, personally, I'm skeptical of this view for a number of reasons. Like the previous, like the previous explanation from the from the previous view, this view ultimately places the responsibility on decisions and actions of the parents and the caregivers. For example, whether or not to baptize an infant, if that would even work, which I don't believe it would, uh, or it does, but even if it did, uh, there's no faith on the part of the child, and so uh, it seems to violate so many principles of New Testament uh, soteriology uh, in, in removing personal faith and the free will of an individual and placing it on the decision of someone else. Uh, and it also suffers from the erroneous doctrine of baptismal regeneration. And what I mean by that is the idea that baptism itself has some sort of supernatural efficacy apart from personal faith, that the very act of baptism can save a person whether or not a person responds in faith. And that simply does not appear to be the case in Scripture. Scripture emphasizes that faith is necessary for salvation. Yes, we must be baptized as part of the new birth experience, uh, but uh, no baptism is valid or efficacious without personal faith on the part of the individual being baptized. And so for those reasons, I would tend to be skeptical of and even reject this view that young people or young children who die will suffer damnation and go to hell automatically. I reject infant baptism because of the false doctrine of baptismal regeneration. And I also reject the view that the parents have the ultimate decision over the salvation of their child through baptism or other means. And that brings us to the last view that I want to talk about here today. And this view is that young children are not aware moral agents and therefore receive salvation by default. Let me repeat that. This view is, and sometimes it's called age of accountability or something else, and we'll explain all that in a moment, but it's basically that young children are not aware of moral agents and therefore receive salvation by default. In other words, if, if a preborn baby dies, if an infant dies, if a toddler or someone else who is not morally developed enough to understand right from wrong or receive or reject Jesus Christ, if and when they die, they would go to heaven. So first, a little bit more background is necessary to understand this view. The testimony of Scripture is that salvation is an individual, personal experience and divine judgment is on the basis of sins committed voluntarily and consciously in our lives. A few verses of Scripture, 2 Corinthians 5 and 10, For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that everyone may receive the things done in his body according to what he hath done, whether good or bad. Romans 2 and 6, speaking of the judgment, says, Who will render to every man to his deeds? 
Romans 14 and 12. So then every one of us shall give account of himself to God. So again, two themes are clear in these verses of scriptures and many others that we don't have the time to get into. That salvation is an individual personal experience and that divine judgment or condemnation is given on the basis of sins committed voluntarily and consciously in our lives. So that's the first premise that we need to understand to understand uh, this view. The second premise is this, that all mankind is without excuse for rejecting the general revelation of God, which is clearly seen uh, in creation or clearly evident. And Romans 1 and 18 uh, tells us this, for God's wrath is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of people who by their unrighteousness suppress the truth. Since what can be known about God is evident among them because God hath, has shown it to them. Verse 20, for his invisible attributes, that is his eternal power and divine nature have been clearly seen since the creation of the world being understood through what he has made. As a result, people are without excuse. And then it goes on from there. But the bottom line of this, of this principle in Scripture is there is sufficient revelation of God in order to establish moral accountability. So heathen and unbelievers, uh, they reject this evidence of the natural order before anything else can be said or done. This is called general revelation. Uh, through clearly seen through the creation of the world, understood through what he has made. So God, evidence of God's existence is all around us in nature. The Psalms also testify of these very things. And Romans says people are without excuse. So what this is pointing to is that general revelation is in and of itself is not sufficient for salvation. We can't just look at the handiwork of God's creation, conclude there's a God and that's enough to be saved. We do have to accept uh, the revelation of Jesus Christ and the new birth experience to be saved. But what this is telling us is that general revelation is sufficient for condemnation. So God is morally justified in condemning and, and dishing out divine judgment on unbelievers and heathen based on their refusal to accept the general revelation he's given to. So sometimes people ask, and I don't want to get in the weeds on this, but it's important to point out, what would happen to a, to a person who has never heard of Jesus Christ, who has never had the gospel delivered to them? How can they be accountable to God for something that they've never been exposed to? And the answer is in Romans 1. Uh, they may not have had the gospel delivered to them, but they are still, God is still justified in condemning them based on their rejection of God's natural or God's general revelation. The specific revelation of the gospel, it doesn't even come into play because they're already condemned on their rejection of general revelation. I don't have time to go into it any further, but the point is that's the criteria for uh, condemnation. That's the criteria for divine judgment. So those with no moral competency, including infants, young children, what have you, both logically and biblically, they cannot be held to the same moral standard. Since infants, young children cannot receive this general revelation, and since they do not have the capacity to respond to it, much less willfully reject it, since they are not capable of personal acts of sin and willful disobedience, then therefore it appears that children dying at a young age are saved because they do not and indeed cannot satisfy the conditions of divine judgment and condemnation. In other words, young people have not rejected the revelation of God in the same way that unbelievers and heathen have. And so theologically, we must take make a distinction between culpability, that is liability for the sin nature, which we've already discussed, and accountability, that is liability for sinful action. Culpability is a major obstacle to holiness that we cannot overcome without divine help. 
but accountability is the righteous and just criteria for salvation or condemnation. Young children have no moral accountability because they have uh, no moral competency. They have not rejected the general revelation of God, and therefore they do not meet the criteria for divine judgment and condemnation. Now, some people say, oh, that's a lot of, you know, beating around the bush and a lot of conjecture. But yet there are other verses of Scripture that seem to substantiate this understanding. For example, Isaiah 7 and 16. This is a prophecy that confirms that young children are not capable of rejecting evil and choosing good. It's a prophecy concerning the son of King Ahaz. And the, and the idea is that King Ahaz is wondering if these other kings who are his enemies, if they're going to prevail over him. And the prophecy is given in Isaiah 7 and 16 that before the son of King Ahaz knows to reject what is good or bad, uh, knows to reject what is bad and choose what is good before that ever happens the land of these two kings that the king dreads will be abandoned and so um you know that's not the that's not the immediate context of the, of the of the verse but uh it uses this principle that is understood uh by the king and by his contemporaries to show that there is a point in a young human's life that they have no capability to reject what is bad and choose what is good. In other words, they are morally incompetent. And there's other uh, explanations in the Old Testament. A powerful foreshadowing of this truth that children are not moral free agents and therefore not accountable for sin can be seen in the story of Israel entering into the promised land. And I'll just describe this very briefly. You may recall uh, that because of Israel's unbelief and the report that was brought back by the spies, God told the people of Israel that none of that generation would be allowed to enter in the promised land because they have sinned by bringing back the bad report of unbelief and not trusting in God for their deliverance. However, God made an exception for the young children, and that exception was due to their moral innocence at the time. Deuteronomy 1 and 39 says, Moreover, your little ones which ye said should be a prey, and your children, which in that day had no knowledge between good and evil, they shall go in thither, and unto them will I give it, and they shall possess it. So God is saying that young children who were too young to know anything about the knowledge between good and evil, because they didn't reject me, because they didn't have the moral competency uh, to buy in to this sin, uh, they're going to be allowed to enter the promised land. But everyone who is an adult or, or of the age of moral accountability, if you would, they are going to die before uh, the people are allowed to enter into the promised land. And another possible foreshadowing of this understanding involves the account of David's son, King David. So you may recall that the firstborn son of David and Bathsheba was a result of the adultery between the two. And as a result, uh, the Lord, uh, uh, the baby rather, is stricken by the Lord and eventually dies. Uh, and so prior to the death, for seven days prior to the death of this baby, David is seen in Scripture fasting and praying uh, for, because of this child. But after the death of the child, immediately when the child died, da dies, David stops mourning. He washes his face, uh, he resumes eating, he stops his fast and resumes eating, and he worships the Lord as, as he normally would. Now, David's servants were confused by what they seemed to see as odd behavior on the part of David, so they asked the king why he was responding in such a way. And in 2 Samuel 12 and 22, David answered, he said, While the baby was alive, I fasted and wept because I thought, who knows? The Lord may be gracious to me and let him live. But now that he is dead, why should I fast? Can I bring him back again? I'll go to him, but he will never return to me. So David seems to have an understanding. He seems to have a hope of a reunification with his departed son at some point in the future. Now, some skeptics of this view say, well, David was just referring to death. I can join him in death, but he can't join me in 
in life again. I can go to the grave, but he's not going to be resurrected. But this explanation seems inadequate to explain David's words and even more so his behavior. Again, it seems that he had a reason to believe in a reunification. Why, if, if David was just speaking about death and the grave, why would he stop his mourning? It seems like he would mourn even the more so for the lost possibility of his son, uh, uh, unless he was just completely heartless. But he understood that in a way this was a mercy because he would be reunited with his son at some point in time, I believe is the correct understanding. So this understanding that children, uh, young children are not moral free agents is sometimes, as I mentioned, uh, referred to as an age of accountability. In other words, at some point in time, uh, every human will reach, uh, when they're yet somewhat young, uh, a, a state in their development, in their mental and moral development, they will be able to differentiate between good and evil. They will be able to choose good and reject evil or choose evil and reject good. So perhaps a better name would be an age of moral awareness. Whatever you want to call it, I, I, I understand that these are not biblical, uh, what I want to say, they're not biblical terminology, uh, but that notwithstanding, uh, it does appear from all these verses of scripture I just mentioned that God does not hold young children who are not yet old enough uh, to distinguish between good and evil. He does not hold them moral, morally responsible and accountable uh, for uh, their actions. And again, we have to differentiate between, uh, between the original sin and uh, moral culpability, uh, between that and moral accountability. And while uh, they don't, no one deserves salvation, but neither do since these young young children don't deserve condemnation and don't meet the uh, criteria for condemnation, the only alternative then is that they must be saved, therefore. So in conclusion uh, of, this, of this topic, to answer the question directly, it does not appear that parents are directly responsible for the salvation of their children in that, number one, children are not saved or lost as a direct result of the parent's salvation. In other words, if a parent is, is saved, then the child is saved. If a parent is lost, then the child is lost. Scripture doesn't hold that. Number two, children are not saved or lost on the basis of some decision or actions that the parent makes. For example, infant baptism. That is not a view of Scripture either, and so we have to reject that. Rather, the most reasonable view of Scripture, I believe, the one with the best biblical support, is that all children are in a state of salvation through God's grace because, number one, they are not free moral agents because they do not yet have the capacity to receive or respond to general or specific revelation of God. Therefore, they cannot reject God as the heathen and unbelievers do. And therefore, they do not and cannot meet the criteria for divine judgment or condemnation. Therefore, it seems scripturally when a young child dies, the only logical and biblical explanation is he or she is saved. In other words, they go to heaven, if you will. This is true of preborn, whether miscarried or aborted, and also of young children all the way up until they are mentally and morally developed enough to distinguish between and choose good over evil and reject sin and receive Jesus in faith via the new birth experience. And uh, again, that's not a specific chronological age. It will vary from person to person depending on uh, their, their mental and moral development of that individual. And so I won't even attempt to try to give an age because it can vary. It's so highly individualized, I believe. But, and this is very important, a very important but, parents, and for that matter, other caregivers, do have an indirect responsibility for the salvation of children. For we are charged with the training and teaching of our children in the ways of the Lord. 
as Deuteronomy 6 and 4 so eloquently says, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord, and thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thine heart, and with all thy soul, with all thy might. And these words which I command thee this day shall be in thine heart, and thou shalt teach them diligently unto thy children. And shalt talk of them when thou sittest in thine house, and when thou walkest in the way, and when thou liest down, and when thou rousest, risest up, and so forth and so on. But the point I want to make in that is thou shalt teach them diligently unto thy children. Proverbs 20, 20, 22 and 6, an oft-quoted verse of scripture, train up a child in the way he should go, and when he is old, he... he old, he will not depart from it. I don't have time to elaborate, but I do want to say this is not an unconditional promise for ultimately when we, all, when we reach that age of moral awareness, we are responsible for our own salvation. Uh, so while it may not be an unconditional promise, it is certainly a precept that is generally true in most cases. Uh, if, if we truly uh, teach up a child in the way they should go, if we set a good example, if we're the role model, if we teach them what they need to know, they're many, many, many times more likely to choose a relationship with the Lord when they should come of age that would lead to their salvation. Ephesians 6 and 4 says, And ye fathers, and I think by extension we could say all parents, but it says, And ye fathers, provoke not your children to wrath, but bring them up in nurture and admonition of the Lord. So here's a New Testament commandment, the New Testament admonition uh, that we should bring up our, uh, our children and nurture and, and fear of the Lord. And then just one parting example of that of Timothy. Uh, and, and Paul talks about how uh, his young protege, Timothy, how his grandmother and his mother both nurtured him in the things of the Lord and led him uh, in knowledge of the Lord. And, and here's this verse of scripture in 2 Timothy 3.15, and from a child thou hast, no, from a child, let me emphasize that po point, thou hast known the holy scriptures which are able to make thee wise unto salvation through faith which is in Christ Jesus. So a wonderful reminder and example to us that we have a obligation and a commandment uh, and a charge to train and teach our children in the ways of the Lord. And if we should fail to, to utilize our influence in this important way, either because we ourselves become lost or even if uh, we ne neglect or are negligent in our spiritual duties in teaching and training our children up, as I said before, it is many, many, many times more likely if we are negligent in this holy obligation that our children will, just as a result of cause and effect of the natural order of things, that is many, many more times more likely that they will not accept the Lord into their lives and uh, be led into a saving relationship with him. We don't want that to happen. So parents and caregivers and ministers and, 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 and church uh, disciples of Jesus Christ who have influence in the lives of others, let's train up our children in the ways of the Lord. So thank you for the question. And uh, I uh, appreciate all those who have stuck around this long to hear the full explanation. So a uh, little longer than I hope to go today, uh, but I think a very good episode and a very good question. So thank you for all who have tuned in today. And until next time, the Lord bless thee and keep thee. The Lord make his face to shine upon thee and be gracious unto thee. The Lord lift up his countenance upon thee and give thee peace. Thank you once again for listening today. God bless you and farewell for now.